The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hey everyone, welcome back to Apex the Five Second Rule, and here we are at episode number 25. So I want to say happy silver anniversary to the Five Second Rule show. I'm Sylvia Quevedo, I'm your host, and today we are going to tackle an incredibly important topic, and that is antimicrobial stewardship and the global SARS-CoV COVID-19 pandemic. To help us out, we have Dr. Allison Weinman. She is an infectious disease physician at the Henry Ford Health System. She also happens to be the medical director of its antimicrobial stewardship program. She's a clinical associate professor of internal medicine at Wayne State University, and she leads the Health System's Immunization Committee and has played a key role in Henry Ford's preparation and response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Weinman. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here and happy anniversary. Thank you. Yeah, who would have thought we made it to 25? Very excited. So Dr. Weinman, um, we've tackled the antimicrobial stewardship topic before here at the at the five second rule because it's so important for our listeners for our healthcare workers everyone out there really needs to understand this topic and oh by the way if you need a primer you'll want to go back and listen to episode uh, two which is antibiotics too much of a good thing where uh, Mark Oliver Wright really gives everyone an understanding of what we mean by that and why it's important, especially you parents out there, anyone going to the doctor. So, so that's, that's our first episode, but today we're really going to talk about antimicrobial stewardship in the context of this global pandemic and some of the challenges we've had. So uh, just to start us off, Dr. Weinman, talk to us a little bit about what you do at your facility as the Antimicrobial Stewardship Director. Yeah, thank you. This is such an important topic and so timely. Um, antimicrobial stewardship is sort of a very long term for just basically safe prescribing and wise prescribing. So, you know, antibiotics have this huge mythology around them. And when you think about it, these drugs have changed the course of human history. And you can't really say that about any other class of drugs. Without antimicrobials, you know, they really changed the course of the world wars, World War II, when the antimicrobials became available. People died of sepsis all the time before that. And then penicillin and sulfa drugs became available and really changed the course, as I said, changed the course of human history. Um, without antimicrobials, we would not have transplant programs. We wouldn't have safe surgeries. We wouldn't have an oncology program. Um, all of these uh, hospital functions really depend on safe antimicrobials. So what's happened over the course of time is that we've become very complacent about antibiotics because they are miraculous drugs. They've saved millions of lives. Um, but what's happened is now 
you know, the, the germs are becoming very wise and they become resistant to antimicrobials. And all antimicrobials and all drugs for that matter can cause harm to patients. So really it's a matter of conserving antimicrobials by decreasing drug resistance, making sure that we're giving the right drug at the right dose to the patient who actually has an infection um, that's a bacterial infection that will respond to antibiotics and making sure that we do it for the right duration. Um, and with the twin goals of patient safety, decreasing patient harm and decreasing drug okay. Okay, so that's a lot. And again, go back to episode number two. But um, I also want to point out that in episode number five of the five second rule, we have an it's called bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Oh my! And it helps uh, listeners understand what the difference is because microbes constitutes a huge body of of species. Right? We are talking about bacteria, then we have viruses, and we have fungi. Antibiotics are used to treat bacterial bacteria, correct? That's correct. But we also focus on drugs that fight viruses and fungi as well. That's all covered under okay. antimicrobial. Thank you for that clarification. And Dr. Weinman, just uh, again, some, some common infections that um, we might go to the doctor for and ask for an antibiotic. Sure. So there's appropriate antimicrobial use and inappropriate antimicrobial use. So for example, if you have a cold, that's usually a virus and you don't need an antimicrobial. You just need symptom relief, right? We all feel kind of lousy when we have a cold. Remember back before COVID, just simple colds um, where you might not have a fever, but you might feel stuffed up or congested. So you want to decongest into an antihistamine or some Tylenol if you have a little low-grade fever. And that's a common... Uh, place where antimicrobials in the past have been used. So patients, you know, come and they want something done. Doctors feel very pressured to do something. And so an antimicrobial is prescribed. And it really doesn't do the patient any good at all. In fact, it exposes them to the harm. All, all antibiotics, all drugs of any kind, even aspirin or penicillin, can cause harm. So um, really, we're trying to redirect our efforts, especially for URIs or um, upper respiratory tract infections, to say that you don't need an antimicrobial for that. You need symptom relief. Okay, so let me stop there, because I think this is important. Stop asking your doctor for an antibiotic when you have a cold, and not all urinary, urinary tract infections require an antibiotic. And I'm just, I want to go into say the pediatric sort of common beyond the cold, UTIs, ear infections, for example, Dr. Wyman. Um, what might we say about ear infections and just other common ailments that a pediatric practice might find? Well, let me start by saying that the most common reason kids go to the emergency room is because of side effects from antimicrobials. Um, there's been a lot of studies focusing on ear infections, which is a really common cause of um, folks getting antibiotics. And it's certainly true that many of these, even with fluid in the ear, and your kid will look terrible and might even have a fever, um, really don't respond well to antibiotics because mostly they're viral as well. So it's another common cause. So um, I think there's been a shift in culture as people have been more educated and patients are now realizing that antimicrobials can do harm. And we've certainly seen a shift in people wanting antimicrobials. Um, so it's a good thing to have a conversation with your doctor. Is an antimicrobial the best thing? Do I need an antibiotic? Or, um, and I'm finding now patients often relieved to hear that they don't need an antibiotic, but we have other things to offer them for symptom relief. Right. Okay. And we're going to get to the, the pandemic and some of the, the interesting challenges um, with antimicrobial stewardship. But I want to say uh, in September 2021, uh, a report came out about antibiotic use after mastectomy is quite common, but with small benefit. It's out of the Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology Journal. And so I think we could do 10 shows on, on the use of antibiotics and, and break down um, the, the different ailments, the different surgical procedures. So we've set the stage again. Um, a lot of this work preceded the global pandemic. It has been years in the making where the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization have implored uh, us to really look at this prescribing because some have, have dubbed this the, the second pandemic. In other words, 
if we don't get a handle on the resistance of some bacteria, that means a common infection could kill you. So this is, this is a big deal. But I want to talk especially now about what are some interesting um, events around antimicrobial stewardship and COVID-19. Because obviously, we've in the United States have surpassed over 600,000 deaths, millions of people ending up in the hospital, and ending up in the hospital in the ICU. So Dr. Wyman, help us understand some of the challenges that we're seeing with antimicrobial stewardship and the pandemic. So let me just set the playing field. So pre-COVID, there's a lot of data that up to 60% of antibiotic use in the hospital is completely unnecessary, completely unnecessary. Either the patient doesn't have an infection or they have something else and that they're not an antibiotic is not going to help. So that's the playing field, and that's national data and international data, and pretty similar figures in the ambulatory or outpatient setting. So that's the basis on which antimicrobial programs are predicated to to level set back to necessary antimicrobial use. Because even when necessary and someone does have a bacterial infection or has an infection that will respond to an antimicrobial, they can still have harm from the antibiotic. So these are potentially harmful agents. So when COVID came along, you know, we didn't really know much. It was a brand new infection, as you all know. And at the beginning, we really were looking for a pneumonia or a lower respiratory tract infection. That's what we're looking for. And I was seeing patients the first uh, month or two of the pandemic, and we quickly realized that we didn't know what COVID looked like. Um, Patients came in looking really septic. So when we say septic, they're they're, uh, not able to maintain their blood pressure. They're sick enough to go to the ICU. They have all kinds of problems with multi-system organ problems, so they can't breathe, their kidneys shut down, et cetera. And we were seeing these unusual presentations of COVID that had not really been well described from the epidemic in Wuhan, which seemed to be more of a pneumonia or lower respiratory tract infection. So we saw early on that folks were getting really sick and going to the ICU. And normally what we do when patients look septic, you know, there's a lot of um, emphasis on giving patients timely antibiotics because when someone has a bacterial infection or a fungal infection that's making them septic or unstable enough to go to the ICU, time counts. And you want to make sure you give them antibiotics in a very timely manner. And so what's happened is that we those presentations, we didn't realize it was all COVID at the beginning. So a lot of people were just giving antibiotics because the patients look sick as heck and trying to save them and then inadvertently causing drug resistance. And what we found is that, you know, really commonly patients with COVID and, you know, I just want to give a shout out to everybody out there who's been affected by COVID either direct or in, indirectly. We all wish we could unsee what we've seen these these last 18 or so months. It's just been an, a horrendous time for healthcare workers, for anybody living in America um, or the world during this, this pandemic. It's just been enormously... Um, tragic and a lot of loss of life and suffering. But we've seen that people stay in the ICU for a very long time. And anybody who's in the hospital for a long time, as I'm sure you've discussed on some of your other podcasts, is at risk of getting bacterial infections because we do a lot of invasive things in the ICU. We put lines in people to maintain their blood pressure. We give them drugs through those central lines. We put in catheters to monitor the urine output and make sure their kidneys don't fail and other maneuvers. And On top of that with COVID, we all have to put on this cumbersome PPE um, and people were kind of trying to conserve PPE at the beginning of the pandemic. Some places actually ran out of PPE or people were reusing them. So it meant when you were going from patient to patient, normally we get rid of all our PPD and put on new PPE and many places had to conserve their PPE. So it became a big deal to go into those rooms and added to that patients, you know, healthcare workers were getting sick at the beginning of the epidemic. So people were truthfully frightened, not so much frightened for themselves, but frightened to bring home COVID to their families. So uh, patients got a lot of remote access. They were monitored remotely or different ways. And so maybe line care wasn't as fastidious. Maybe um, they had to be positioned differently, so-called proning, where you put the patients on their belly to help their lung um, lungs fill with oxygen, et cetera. So um, the impact of, of antimicrobials over this time was, first, we we're using them up front. Then secondly, people were frightened to stop them 
And then thirdly, patients, even if they weren't on antibiotics, if they stayed in the ICU long enough, they often got a hospital-acquired infection, which was a problem nationally and internationally. And so then they did need antimicrobials, but sometimes people were afraid to stop them, so they got them for too long. Oh, my long. God. This is and like a bad, you know, horror movie at this point. It is. It's, it's like a horror movie that keeps unfurling. And then what happens is if you're in the ICU for long enough, and we're talking, you know, some people have been in the ICU 80 days, 90 days. And then you're looking at now they've had all these antibiotic courses. They're in a place where ICUs often have drug resistant infections. People's hand washing may be suboptimal. They, there were staffing shortages. So then you're looking at an infection that may be more resistant to treat. And it's certainly true that drugs that uh, anti uh, sorry, pathogens that are resistant to antimicrobials, they result in longer lengths of stay. They increase the risk of mortality and morbidity in patients because the antibiotics are second line agents, et cetera. So it's just this never ending so circle. Me, let of me interrupt you, Dr. Wyman. Um, yeah. And then we've tackled some of these topics uh, on some of our different episodes here, but yeah, it's, it's the Titanic. It's awful. You know, it's one thing after another, but Talk to us a little bit about the pathogens that, um, in your in your experience, uh, are more are I don't want to say most problematic. They're all problematic, but in terms of COVID patients, um, are you seeing um, certain pathogens that are particularly you know problematic, or um, is it just across the board depending on where you are in the world or in the country? It, is yeah, that's a really good question. I think everybody's seeing uh, an increase in certain infections. For example, MRSA or MRSA, which stands for methicillin resistant Staph aureus, which refers to a germ that started off in the ICUs in the 70s and 80s and is now widespread throughout hospitals and the community. And it's really just more resistant to treat. And also it is a more aggressive infection, a more virulent infection. And it is associated with the probably increased use of these central lines that we need to save lives. Um, and all across the country, we've seen a bump up in these MRSA infections. Also, lines tend to get colonized with um, with our skin flora because you can't keep a line in, you know, you're always opening, closing lines so that sterile connection is disconnected. And people have also seen a bump up in fungal infections like candida species, which can be difficult to treat. So, you know, we've certainly all seen in hospitals and certainly with these long stayers in the ICU, even before COVID, people getting drug resistance that's so severe that you're on your last ditch antibiotic. And it's not rare anymore in the 2000s to see patients that actually end up in hospice because you simply have run out of antibiotics. It doesn't happen. It used to be very rare. Now I would say even before COVID, it was not, it was not as rare. So you would see it occasionally that somebody would just be have needed so many antibiotics for different reasons. The longer they stay in the hospital, you kind of run out of antibiotic options. And it's really tragic in, you know, 2021 when somebody has to be considered for hospice because you've got, you're sort of in the pre-antibiotic era. You've got nothing wow. to offer in wow. terms of antibiotics. And that's a very sobering moment for anybody, you know, to talk to somebody and say, I, I, I've run out of antibiotics. And that's, you know, happening across the country and in certain settings more than others. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we can't drive this home enough. A infection control and hospital epidemiology uh, article from 2021 um, really talks about it's it's entitled "The Impact of Coronavirus Disease 2019 on Healthcare Associated Infections in 2020." a summary of data reported to the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is, of course, the database that hospitals and clinicians report certain uh, healthcare-acquired infections, such as MRSA, um, your catheter-associated UTIs, your central line bloodstream infections. I'm trying to avoid all of our acronyms for our listeners, but they've heard it. If you're if you're a regular listener here on the Five Second Rule, you've heard some of these. You're 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 getting the lingo. Um, ventilator associated events. Um, I want you to touch a little bit on that, Dr. Wyman, because, you know, if you pick up the New York Times, the Washington Post, any, any newspaper, and you look at what's been going on during the, the global pandemic, in some United States, we are talking about rationing of care. We're talking about, um, limited supply of ventilators. And so, 
talk to us a little bit about those ventilator uh, associated events and and how that might impact um, antimicrobial stewardship. Yeah, thank you for that. I think one of the extraordinary things about the COVID epidemic is that it affected healthcare workers early on. So other epidemics, like for example, the AIDS epidemic, didn't really, healthcare workers weren't frightened of getting AIDS because we understood it was a bloodborne well, pathogen. Well, early, early, I think there was some nervous, yeah. Was, early, yeah. early, early, early. Yeah. But yeah. it was very early understood that really, apart from needle sticks and other incidental sharps injuries, you really couldn't catch AIDS. Whereas at the beginning with COVID, it really, there were healthcare workers becoming sick. And actually many of us, you know, had the tragedy of losing healthcare workers, people that we worked with side by side. In addition to that, we had healthcare workers that had to take time off because they were exposed to COVID or had to be treated for COVID in the hospital. So healthcare worker shortages have been a problem nationally. So uh, I just want to preface what I'm saying by saying that. And that is an ongoing problem, especially with nursing staff and other people. Some people retired who are older. Um, There's just a problem with shortages around around the world now in healthcare workers, and it's something to, to think about. Um, so ventilators, you know, patients who are in the ICU with COVID have to be intubated, so they have a breathing tube put down their throat, and often that stays in place for weeks. And the longer you have any devices in you, the more likely you are to get colonized. So first, you know, either through patient contact with infected healthcare workers' hands or in the environment of the ICU or previous antibiotics, because we all have germs in our bodies. And if you give antibiotics to somebody for, say, they really do have a MRSA infection, you're really exposing all the germs in their body to those antibiotics, and then they become have the opportunity to become resistant. So even if you're appropriately treating with antibiotics, you can cause drug resistance. So the longer you have a tube down your throat, you can imagine that you know, you have to be suctioning secretions out because patients can't clear their airways. And that's when ventilator-associated pneumonias can occur. So if those uh, those germs that are now resistant infect in the lower airways, which was common in COVID, um, then you have a ventilator-associated pneumonia. And that can be very problematic to treat so again. So you've got SARS-CoV infection and potentially another bacterial infection, which is really a double whammy and a nightmare. All right. So... So, and we we do this a lot. We paint an incredibly ugly, terrible picture. But I do want to say prior to the pandemic, there were some really wonderful gains, a lot of education that was being pushed out about this. Certainly APIC had a lot of resources. Our infection preventionists were on the front line of educating healthcare workers on antimicrobial stewardship. Our pharmacy colleagues, physicians, a lot of work campaigning on this, and there were gains. There were uh, reported improvements in prescribing, um, and then the pandemic hit. Okay, here we are well into it, sadly. Give us some some positives, Dr. Weinman, if you can, if you can. I mean, we don't want you to, we don't want to make stuff up, but there are a few bright lights, and um, like I said today, you know, it was just reported that um, prophylactic prescribing of antibiotics for mastectomies, whether it's with immediate reconstruction after, are showing no effect. So publishing something like that, looking at that, you know, will make prescribers go, "Hey, do I really need this?" So talk to us about some positives that we're seeing, or or how are how are clinicians responding? How is the community responding to what we're seeing as an unfortunate consequence of the pandemic to date? I think the biggest, m- most miraculous thing that's come out of COVID is the rapidity with which we developed a safe and effective vaccine. And the reason why that's so important is because, um, the, first of all, it's not new. None of the vaccines are new. The messenger RNA vaccines are not new. They've been used for cancer treatments for decades. So the technology is really old. It was developed for other uh, coronaviruses, infections, et cetera, that, but were never used because those viruses petered out. So really what's amazing. So the whole goal, because truthfully, our treatment of COVID once you're in the hospital, we have a limited number of things that we can do to help. So everything for COVID should be related to prevention. And that's why masking, social distancing became the norm. But really, vaccines are the game changer. Um, And the rapidity with which these vaccines were developed 
um, and they're highly effective. So just for comparison, our flu shots are usually about 20 to 40% effective. We've got vaccines that are 95% effective. The only vaccine we have that rivals that is the measles vaccine, which is in the high 90s. Everything else, all the other vaccines we take routinely, pale into insignificance in terms of success. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't get them. They still are protective, but these vaccines are extraordinary and extraordinary in their safety profile. So I have to say that technology um, to rapidly develop vaccines and also they can also rapidly uh, turn and pivot. So say we get a variant that is very resistant to the current vaccines. The manufacturers can quickly change those messenger RNAs up to give us a new vaccine that is successful. And in fact, people are looking into using that messenger RNA technology in other vaccines like influenza because they're so successful. So I think that's been a huge scientific breakthrough. I think they've been overly politicized, as we all know. Um, I would encourage everybody who hasn't been vaccinated, um, who is eligible, please go get vaccinated. Get your kids vaccinated as soon as they're eligible. Um, this is the only thing that's going to break through this COVID epidemic. And so I think that's been the brightest moment of hope. And prevention is the way to prevent excess antibiotic use, to prevent these hospitalizations, to prevent death um, and hospitalizations and severe disease. And that has those things have been the only things in this whole epidemic that's been shown to prevent severe disease, death, and hospitalization is getting vaccinated. Amen. I mean, Amen. the point is, if you don't get sick, you don't need you don't need a a pill. <laughs> yeah. No. We we definitely at APIC uh, support vaccination. We were among the organizations that signed on to a letter to make it a condition of employment for certainly healthcare uh, settings. Um, yeah, we, we will just say that every chance we get. Um, so again, the idea is prevention so that, um, you know, doctors and other clinicians are not forced to make those tough decisions. And let me, let me tackle something that I think we should do a whole other episode on, and that is diagnostic stewardship. Because early on in the fight for the fight to address, uh, back, you know, resistance, Part of the challenge was for clinicians, it's hard to differentiate sometimes between what is a bacterial versus a viral infection, right? You know that all too well. And so what are your thoughts on some improved diagnostic technology to differentiate some of these? Can you, can you give us um, an insight into that, Dr. Wyman? Yeah, you know, it can be really difficult. And as we talked about with a new infection, very hard to tell sometimes. And my my uh, supposition is that as we became more comfortable with the presentations of COVID, our antimicrobial use in certain circumstances may have diminished, which is great. Um, unfortunately, a septic patient, it's very difficult to tell. And there is no gold standard test. So, you know, we rely on cultures. We still, we rely on rapid diagnostics. Um, we rely on certain other indications um, of whether somebody is septic. So, for example, blood cultures now use a very rapid technology in general. They use a PCR, polymerase chain reaction technology. So we get those blood cultures results becoming positive quicker and a guide to what kind of antibiotic, um, what kind of organism it is. So then we can... Uh, make our best guess, um, which is educated about what, you know, in our healthcare system or other healthcare systems, what antibiotic is best. And that's been a nice breakthrough. Um, there are other rapid diagnostic tests on blood cultures, especially, but still in those early hours of sepsis, there really is no way of differentiating. It comes down to clinical experience um, and looking at the constellation of what is the history of the patient, if they can't provide a history, what is the um, what is your physical exam, what are your lab findings. And it really comes down to the skill and, and diagnostic accuracy. So infectious disease doctors, we're, you know, we're all we see is infections. Um, but again, and here's a pitch for infectious disease doctors, is that you know, we are um, we skew a little older as a specialty. Um, infectious disease doctors historically have not been as well paid as doctors that do procedures. And so for a long time, there was a, there was kind of a, you know, a decrease in the number of people training to be infectious disease doctors. And 
a lot of folks are sort of nearing retirement age. And the good thing that's come out of the epidemic is there seems to be an increased interest yeah. in infectious yeah. diseases and pandemic aware, 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 awareness. Try and get the word out. Awareness. Um, so that's a good thing. And I also want to give a shout out to the infection, practi- infection control practitioners. Your job is all about prevention. I mean, it's an infection prevention and control. So really, rather than treating with antibiotics and letting someone get an infection, the hallmark of what everybody is involved in and invested in healthcare is prevention. If we can prevent COVID, if we can prevent a drug resistance by people washing their hands properly and adhering to infection control practices, you're going to prevent these horrendous infections in patients. And I think that's a really important point to remember, that we should be much more focused on prevention because... Our diagnostic tests, uh, et cetera, are not as good as prevention, and our treatments are still not as good as prevention. Well said, Dr. Weinman, and our infection preventionists out there would just applaud that. They're out there on the the front lines really trying to get that message, trying to work with healthcare workers, um, so much on their plate to address not only the pandemic, but um, the challenges of, of resistance. So... My God, again, it's always the case. We, d- we don't have enough time. We could, we could just go on all day, or maybe that's just me, um, talking about this, this issue. So thanks for the update on what is happening with antimicrobial stewardship during the, the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your time, Dr. Weinman. Thank you for your service on the front lines. And uh, for our listeners, do not forget to tune in to episode two and episode five uh, after you listen to this um, to just sort of give a, a refresher on all the, all the different pathogens. Remember that there is so much information available to you at www.apic.org. Thanks, Dr. Weinman, and uh, we look forward to uh, your success in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Staff and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio Tech is Blake Alvin.